Good afternoon. Welcome to an exchange for media conversation. Today, this Friday, we talked to someone who really doesn't need an introduction in the Indian media and broadcast industry. He's somebody who's seen it all, done it all. He was also exchange for media's first impact person of the year 16 years back. He's somebody, uh, we are doing a conversation because it's contextual to his book that he's just written and published. So let me welcome Mr. Peter Mukherjee, who's an author, is a former CEO of Star India and uh, built Star India to uh, to a level from where it could take a could take a leap. So welcome, Peter. Uh, today we are talking to you about your book, uh, uh, Star Struck. So clearly, for our viewers, if they haven't picked up the book, they can. It's called Peter Mukherjee's writing, Star Struck: Confessions of a T Confessions of a TV Executive. Uh, first of all, Peter, let me start by asking you how have been the last 12 months for you both personally and professionally well anurag before i say anything let me just first of all do uh, what i really want to do which is to say thank you very much for having me here giving me an opportunity to talk to you and to talk to all of your uh, um you know your followers and um, and it is really a pleasure to be able to be back on exchange for media after such a such a long time and it is wonderful uh, a great feeling that i've that I'm experiencing. So uh, thank you for that. Um, your 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 question was how have the last twelve months been? Well, you know, to be honest with you, the last twelve months have been um, have been remarkable. You know, I, I um, in many ways um, it's been very busy writing and finishing and getting all the um, you know the tidying up that's required before a book gets published. Uh, but the people at Westland and have been fantastic dp in particular and uh shweta at the marketing uh, end of the spectrum have been absolutely fabulous so and of course without their help and inputs um you know the book would not have been um you know the way it is today it would have been um a lot less um you know credible i think i think they've, they've really put a lot of time and effort into it but the last 12 months from my point of view have been hectic Partly because of the book, but also despite the the you know the lockdown that's everyone's experienced, um, it really has been a time for introspection um, to be able to kind of realize the value of of um, you know being at home uh, despite being in a in a lockdown mode. Um, and uh, for me, it's been particularly so because um, you know it's been a it's been a cathartic experience for me i've been able to catch up with some friends of mine in the recent past once the lockdown has kind of eased up um but apart from all of that it's been a time for uh, as i said introspection but also a lot of fresh uh thinking and um and i think some of that is is reflected in the in the sort of latter part of the book as well fantastic uh, uh peter uh, let me go back to you know uh, you studied business management, right? Uh, yes. Of course, you went to Doon School, you went to Hartford College in London. Um, and, you know, uh, let's come straight to the book. When you talk of confections of a TV executive, in your book, you write that, uh, you know, when you took over Star TV, uh, you were given a team of very young, relatively inexperienced executives. Uh, and you write in the book that we were operating with a Johnny English approach. Uh, uh, and basically you were saying that, you know, you had no fear, you had no danger, you knew nothing. Uh, so give us a sense of what do you mean when you say that? Elaborate on it. Well, let me tell you, uh, I think, first of all, just to kind of rephrase the given a team, I don't think I was given uh, much of a team, to be honest. When I got here, there were a couple of people um, and they were excellent people, actually, in, in my scheme of things at the time. One, of course, was Yash Khanna. One was Raj Kama. Um, and Raj Nayak, uh, Megha Tata, uh, then she was Monica. Um, and, um, you know, literally a, what I would call a fairly motley crew. And um, so, you know, the early days was really spent in terms of trying to make that and build that team out as far as possible, um, to build it out with, with credible people, passionate people, people who were gutsy, who were daring. Um, and it wasn't necessarily all about you know, somebody who had to have uh, a business management degree or an MBA or 
anything of the sort. Of course, they had to be educated and they had to be, um, had to have a good wherewithal to life, um, had to be um, people who played by the rules and, um, and were really, really hardworking. And, you know, for them, it was, time was not um, uh, something that they would necessarily be looking at uh, you know, on a daily basis, they were just committed to what they had to do. And I think that really is what was the sort of basic composition of, of, um, of the team. But I think, you know, the, the second part of what you said, which is to kind of bringing a set of people together at a point in time was, you know, crucial because we were quite honestly, and, uh, you know, we were a foreign company. We were in English as a language as a service um we had competitors who were in hindi and uh and you know for us it was nothing but an uphill struggle so when when uh, viewers today watch some of the star channels many of them i think will probably forget if they knew at all what it was like in the very early days of this business and how it was at that point transformed so it was done with with extraordinary amount of hard work by the people that you know were there at the company at the time, and then and following that, when I, you know, when I was appointed as chief executive, then I think you know we were able to kind of really put the finishing touches to that to that team and and expand it in different directions in programming, distribution, and so on and so on. I'm sure, we'll talk about that later. Okay, Peter. Uh, one one of the chapters, the second chapter in the book is changing people is better than changing people. Uh, and really the media business is about people. So why don't you give us a glimpse of what's in the chapter and what are you trying to say? You know, that's a, that's a quote which I've credited to Larry Summers, who used to be the, the head of Harvard Business School and, uh, and an eminent uh, politician in the United States many years ago. Uh, but it, I heard that, I heard him say this at a conference and he was, um, you know, it was a fascinating term, which I'd never heard before. So I, in the coffee break, I went and, you know, spent five minutes trying to get his attention and have a chat with him about it. And really what occurred to me at that point was that, you know, changing people is better than changing people. Now you can read it any which way you like, and that's what makes it a, an interesting phrase, right? Um, and for us, and, you know, it was not about changing people's, um, habits it was about changing people if they were not you know cut out for a particular task at hand and i think that's something that we did right at the very beginning and then once we put that team together then it remained pretty much untouched and unscathed all the way through till um, till the time that i actually left in you know in, in the late 2000s but i think the that particular chapter is very much about, um, you know, people's skills, how to manage people, how to kind of make sure that you get the, get the best out of them. Um, and I think obviously you've got to read the book in its entirety to be able to get a sense of, you know, the, the today, the past, and hopefully a little bit about what's likely to come up in the future. Fantastic, Peter. Now, in the forward, uh, you talk about uh, successes and failures are part of life. And while success is good, I believe failure is great. And you quote Rupert Murdoch there and you said, Rupert Murdoch once told you, don't ever miss the opportunity to make the most of a crisis. Uh, and you then go on to thank James and News Corp for giving him, you the opportunity to be able to take a star at that point and make something out of Star India's business. So uh, if you had to say, uh, what was the high point of your innings at Star India, what would that be? Uh, you know, it's a very tough question. There were lots of highs and there were, there were, you know, a few lows as well, but I think there were lots of highs and it would be very hard to kind of pinpoint one, one, you know, unique high point. But I think if I was pushed to the wall on that one, um, I would, I would have to say that, you know, the day we hit 50 out of 50 programs, in the top listings of Hindi general entertainment was certainly has to be for me, uh, you know, a particular, particularly, um, you know, 
memorable milestone moment. Um, I think it was, I would go as far as saying it was probably a life-changing moment, not just for me, but for all the people that worked at Star at the time. Um, because none of this happens with, you know, it's not an individual effort. This is entirely about teamwork. Um, and whosoever is the person that happens to be, you know, leading that team or leading one of the teams that is responsible for making things happen there, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great moment in that person's life. Uh, and for me, that was without doubt, I think, you know, um, you know, 50 out of 50 hasn't happened before, um, hasn't happened since, since. and uh, I would say, look, unlikely to happen for quite some time yet, because, you know, the market has changed, the dynamics are different. And so, um, uh, you know, high point wise, yeah, 50 out of 50 without doubt. Okay. And what would you say about, uh, you know, you roped in Amitabh Bachchan for KBC, uh, and you know, that was itself uh, a very big success. You know, you know, uh, you suddenly the channel uh, look started looking good. The channel had a big driver and uh, you started taking big bets. Uh, I remember the week you hit 50 out of 50. I know uh, we did a piece on exchange media, so on and so forth. But to me, um, the Khan Banega Karodpati uh, and the way it panned out on Star uh, after some other not so successful starts uh, was also a very big milestone. Would you agree? Yes, of course. Look, I think, um, you know, it was a very big milestone without doubt. But I think what was um, significant for us at the time was not just KBC. I think KBC was certainly, a, um, you know, one of the main milestones or major milestones in, in that journey. But uh, it was also about, you know, our programming team feeling confident with the lineup of programming that they had, which was following KBC in order to be able to then, you know, continue that, uh, you know, the opportunity that the battering ram of KBC provided to the other shows that followed. Um, and had it not been for KBC, maybe the others wouldn't have performed as well, right? And certainly if it wasn't a combination of all of the shows in prime time that delivered that 50 out of 50, then I think, you know, the overall performance of the channel would not have been as, as astounding for us and for the marketplace as it was. So without doubt, I think, you know, the placing of bets is something I think one has to do on a, on a regular basis. You don't really think about it too much when you're, when you're at the table, so to speak. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you go forward with a, with a, you know, with the best intent, with, and you always put your best foot forward. So we were hoping that it would work. We had no idea that it would or it wouldn't. Uh, as you say, we had experimented with uh, a variety of things before that. Uh, my predecessor, Mr. Ratikant Basu, who had um, initiated this entire move into what we used to call localization um, at the time. Um, and as part of that exercise, he had you know, introduced Hindi programming, which he could get at relatively short notice because, you know, programs take time to produce and put together and get on air. So he was able to get his hands on some of the content that was available in the marketplace. Not a great deal, but we got some. Uh, some of it, you know, was, was reasonable success. Some was not so successful, but overall, our push into localization started at that point. I was fortunate that some of those experimental uh, aspects had been taken care of prior to my, you know, sitting on the saddle. And had it not been for that, maybe I would have felt the same amount of pressure that, you know, my predecessor felt in terms of going down the route of trying dubbing, trying to sort of patch together content that came from here and there and everywhere, and not having a clear cut kind of strategy in place to say, look, now we can go ahead and do, uh, uh, you know, 100% Hindi content. Um, we were restricted from a, from a legal point of view. We had restrictions from our, uh, you know, from our partners. Um, and I think all of those things had to be taken into account. And uh, in many ways, as I say, I think I was very fortunate that some of those had already been done before I got there so that I didn't have to go through that, those, those tunnels myself. 
I was out in the open. We were we were able to play, uh, and we had you know all the all the resources at our disposal at that point. We weren't restricted in any particular way. So I think uh, big bets possibly, but you know as I say, you those are things you do on a daily basis, and you know you don't stop because you have to place a big bet. I think. I think placing big bets is, um, you know, is an exciting part of the of the role. Yeah, and I, I, I'll take some of the chapters. I, uh, you know, I want um, the viewers and readers to kind of get a glimpse in the book. And so I'm sticking to the book. In the chapter eight in the book, you talk about winners have parties, losers have meetings, <laughs> and you, of course, uh, uh, attribute that to Gary Davy, and um, you talk about. Uh, um, you know how on a um, lazy day in March 1999, you were lounging about at your home with your brother Gotham. And why don't you tell that story? Well, it's a it's a lovely story, and it 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 kind of gets takes me down memory lane very nicely because it it was a Sunday afternoon, and I was sitting there having had my um, you know Sunday uh, preferred lunch, which was you know some nice Bengali cuisine of uh, fish and fish and some kind of rice. Um, and uh, you know, my my my, we didn't have mobiles at that particular point in time, and uh, or maybe we did, but my one of my phones rang, and I remember answering it, and there was Gary on the phone, and he said, "Mukas, um, we got a minute. Can I speak to you?" I said, "Yeah, of course." And um, and he went on to tell me that look, he had a he had something in mind which he wanted me to do, and uh, would I would I consider doing it? And it was a question which said, you know, this is what we have in mind. This is what we want to do. Are you are you up for it? And really, it was a question of, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, is the Pope Catholic, because, it, you know, the answer to that is a, is a resounding yes. And without, without uh, you know, battering an eyelid or, you know, missing a heartbeat, I said, I was going to tell him, then I said, look, hold on, I'll, I'll call you back um, just to kind of get my breath and make sure that I wasn't kind of in some form of cuckoo land and hearing things. So I had to kind of sit down. Uh, I had to go and have a quick chat with my brother, Gautam, um, and say, look, this is the call I've just had, and I better call him back right now because uh, he'd be waiting for my response. So so I called him back, and of course, as I say, it was a resounding yes. And, and um, for me, that was, uh, 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 you know, I think an exciting moment, but also incredibly frightening because it was uh, a business that was really in, in, a, in a fair amount of trouble as as you know as the channel was at that particular point in time you know we had tried numerous things wasn't working we were not sure whether the the levels of investment would continue um you know we were on shaky ground put it that way and and uh, to take on a business at that point was always going to be a a, a challenge and be a risk um but you know i think we were all wired differently in those days so we say absolutely yes definitely let's go for it um and I remember telling Gary, look, I'm going to need an awful lot of help from you. And somewhere in that conversation, he rem I remember him telling me that, you know, winners have parties, losers have meetings. Um, and for me, that has always stuck. And I've used it time and again. Um, and I think it kind of resonates with, with people uh, a fair amount even today. Fantastic. In the chapter six, uh, you know, you quote Rupert Murdoch and you say, when you are a catalyst for change, you make enemies. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of the ones, the one I've got. Uh, this is a quote from Ruben Murdoch. Now, uh, give us a sense of this chapter and what you say in this chapter. Well, you know, the quote, in a way, sums up a lot of what's in it. Um, and as you're progressing into uh, into a sort of territory where you are taking on your competitors, in in a meaningful kind of way then you do run up against people who you know want to try and slow you down or pull you down and and i think in india we have a uh in in many cases we have a bit of a crab mentality so if you see somebody doing well you tend to kind of rather than give that person a helping hand and pull them up you know you tend to kind of drag them down and i think i i got a sense that that some of that was happening to us um in different quarters and uh, I think largely because we were a foreign company and uh, and you know Rupert all his um, you know for all his sins has you know was was a was a, a, 
a, a maverick in in lots of parts of the world and um and i think some of the some of our you know competitors at that particular point in time in india were were a bit nervous of what he might what he might do whether he would get into print whether he would do things with um you know with television whether it was going to be you know introducing pay services direct to home all of those things were kind of on the on the agenda uh but from a competitor point of view we were you know in a situation where we did have uh, a fair amount of um um i would say stress that we needed to deal with in addition to the regular day-to-day -day management of a company so a fair amount of management time in terms of number of hours in the day was gobbled up in in really addressing those kinds of issues um which i think is a bit sad because had we had a bit more time to be able to you know not have to worry about those kind of issues then um, you know maybe things would have been even better for us okay now let me ask you two three questions which are a little broader than your book and then we'll come back to the book again one is uh, uh, today uh, star india is part of disney right uh -huh. uh, also the environment has changed ott has become the biggest driver of content consumption and also content creation right so uh, tell me uh, when you see star india from outside or disney india if i may call what is it that you see well you know sadly i i got to say this and and be candid about it because i i actually don't watch very much of you know star channels currently uh, the ones i really like are um you know uh, are not not necessarily available everywhere and and, um, and i think the um, the combination that star and disney has is extremely powerful extremely powerful both in terms of content in terms of brand in terms of you know uh, following and the services that they offer are are extraordinary and i see no reason why they should not be you know complete market leaders and and you know in 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 time to come um what level of service and what area of service they they decide to kind of venture into whether it's just sticking with ott or whether it's going into a whole range of other things is something that time will tell but i i also happen to believe that you know there are some other big players in the market in 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 the overall universe at the moment not just in india um and some of these people are have got deep pockets and it's you know quite likely that in the next perhaps 12 maybe 18 months it wouldn't be surprising if you know companies like disney star are you know potential targets for some of the even bigger players like apple and google and facebook and so on and i think that's something that they need to be thinking about i would think uh, which in fact, they Peter, in fact yeah. Peter, just to bit, accept your thought and build on it when Murdoch decided to sell it and he made the first announcement he basically said to be able to deal with Facebook Google and Amazon uh, it would be necessary to do this Disney tie-up or you know partnership or sell out whatever you want to call it and he basically echoed your line of thought saying to be able to take on these bigger players uh, we need to be together with other players and we need to have size and scale to be able to uh, take them on. So clearly what you're saying is on, I'm sure everyone's mind and you know, every media executive thinks about uh, this all the time. Um, I also want to ask you, uh, post you left Star, Star India did well, according to sports programming. Uh, now, what do you think about sports programming? Uh, it is said that Disney, there's speculation that Disney is not very keen on sports programming in India. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't really comment on that. I think, uh, you know, sports is a fundamental part of television viewing in this country, whether it's cricket or whether it's, you know, people who love motor racing or, um, uh, uh, you know, Premier League football and other, other sort of events that happen from time to time, tennis, the Grand Slams, etc. And you know, I think for for anybody to suggest that Disney is not committed to sports in India it would be, I think, would either they know an awful lot, uh, and they know something that you know the rest of us don't, or that it is, um, you know, it's inaccurate. I think they they are totally committed to it. Um, you know, as a viewer, 
I think it's um, it's it's terrific that you know one gets such a such a wide array of of sports content. Um, you know, when I was when I was a star many years many years ago now, but um, you know, I happen to be on the board of ESPN Star Sports, and um, you know, it was it was no surprise really that you know at one point the two companies parted ways and Star Sports became independent of ESPN and ESPN became independent of Star. Um, and at that point, you know, again, it was not a surprise that when when the Disney um, takeover of Star happened, that sports was going to become a key feature because Star had invested a heck of a lot of money in cricket, which A, they needed to recover, but also they needed to kind of, um, you know, present to Disney a, a fairly well-dressed bride. Um, and, and I think that's what happened. There was general entertainment and there was sport, which was, um, you know, buttressed by enormous amount of valuable cricket, which uh, Disney had but no choice to, to take on board. And so given the commitments that, you know, Star would have to uh, the sports bodies that, that control that particular sport, then I think, you know, Disney is definitely committed to, to sports in, in, in India for the future. I doubt it. I doubt if they have any second thoughts about it at the moment. And Peter, I'm asking you a hypothetical question. If you were to ask to be run a, 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 a OTT company, a new media company, a content company, I, uh, would you still be interested in running something like that? Because you like building things. You like making bets you like uh, you know creating teams you like making an impact uh, and you you still have a lot left in you and you know when one reads the book it gives the sense that uh, uh, you keep a watch on what's happening around and have a very nuanced point of view so would you consider uh, building another ott media content content tech play whatever you want to call it uh, a new age media platform well it's it's you know it, thoughts cross your mind from time to time and conversations happen um but i think running one of these companies is not something that is um you know as appealing to me today as you know it was when i had the opportunity to run star um for a variety of reasons and i won't go into all of them but i think suffice to say that you know um I think you need, again, you need to place your bet on which of these companies you would want to be part of. Um, and and you ha again, with that, you have to look at it in, in a different way. It's not about, you know, the, the, the brand today, but it's really what you can, can take and change and turn that brand into in, you know, in a short space of time. Um, how are you going to kind of make sure that viewers are resonating with the content that you're putting out um you know I, I i'm a great believer that i think you know content regulation for ott platforms is something that should happen now i'd be very unpopular by you know uh, amongst a lot of people for me saying that but i think that in a marketplace like india where there is um where there are diverse issues at at work and at play um I think not having any con any regulatory environment for OTT content is is risky and dangerous for the industry. Um, and I think, therefore, until such time as we are a more mature marketplace, um, I think we need to have that level of um, you know controlling and engagement by by a regulator. Okay, and Peter, I want to uh, get back to your book in the chapter fourteen. You say optimism, pessimism, fuck that. We're going to make it happen. As God is my bloody witness, I'm hell bent on making it work. You quote, quote Elon Musk. This is something that Elon Musk said. And uh, you, you go on to say in the chapter that Rupert knew that we wouldn't get a winner every day that the show was on air and you're talking about uh, um, the programming that you brought in. But even if we had a winner every so often, the channel would lift up. Uh, I cannot think of any other chief executive other than perhaps Richard Branson of Virgin or Elon Musk of Tesla 
who could take such a significant decision in such a flash. And again, in the chapter, you talk about how Rupert was seen to be slow in taking decisions and so on and so forth. In the press, he was pretty unpopular about that. So give us a sense of what's in the chapter. You know, we talked about placing big bets earlier. Um, and part of this has got a, a reflection on that. Um, and I've used example of Richard Branson and Elon Musk, who are both, you know, frontline warriors in this entire space. Um, as is as is Rupert in many ways, because, you know, at a time when he was being criticized for um, for not having, you know, sufficient amount of investments in new media um you know he he sent one of his executives into into uh, uh, bangalore and bombay and and delhi and so on and you know started to buy into internet companies one of those happened to be india.com and india was indya um and you know the volume of investments that happened and the speed with which that happened at that time was extraordinary very little of it actually worked, but it was important that it was seen to be, we was, you know, it was seen to be being done. And it was important that at that particular point in time, those investments were being made so that there was, you know, a, a level of information being generated, which suggested that News Corp and Star were very much involved in looking at new media. And I think new media for a lot of people at that time was, was really anything which had a dot com attached to it. Um, and whereas today it's quite different. So I think if you are talking about the likes of Richard Branson and Elon Musk and, and, uh, and Rupert Murdoch, I think they very much are part and parcel of the same mold in, in different eras. Elon is today, you know, Richard Branson was yesterday and Rupert, uh, bless him was, you know, perhaps day before yesterday. And, and so from that point of view, um, you know, they are, you know, literally chips off the old block. They are the same. They are, in many ways, their their thinking, their view on on how to kind of look at a business, how to make it grow, consider consumer behavior patterns, is uh, are all pretty much the same. Okay, fantastic. Uh, uh, Peter, also uh, right at the start, you talked about uh, you know the leaders or the team that you had. You had Raj Naik. You talked about Rajnath Kamath. You talked about Ms. Tata, uh, you know, when you look at Star India that you nurtured, uh, a lot of people who are part of your core team have gone on to build something valuable post their stints in Star. Uh, whether you look at a Raj Naik who successfully turned around colors and built it into the uh, powerhouse it is. Of course, uh, you know, Rajesh Kamath, who used to be a marketing manager and I used to meet him when I used to come and meet you at Star, uh, ran colors before. Uh, uh, Raj, right? And then you look at Samir, he continues to be doing well. He's doing well at applause, right? And you look at uh, Ms. Tata, she's running Discovery, uh, so on and so forth. So, Lord, you look at Tarun Katyal, and I can give you many others, you know, who worked with you uh, or were in your team. They've gone on to do so well. Uh, and why do you think uh, that has happened? Uh, while Z is an institution in the television business in its own right and has <clears throat> produced leaders, you know, Star has produced uh, professional managers and outstanding uh, creators. Uh, so why do you think that happened? Well, I think it's, you know, as a company, we were very fortunate that we had a really good set of people who were, um, you know, with us at the time. Obviously, they were hired for all the right reasons in that some, you know, somewhere within their within their construct there was um uh, uh you know a sense that all of these people will you know a they are great performers they are like um you know precious gems um they 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 need to be groomed to the extent where their skills are you know enabled to flourish um and it's very hard to kind of contain people of that caliber to be, um, you know, and, and kept from performing at their best. So, you know, whether it is Mega, whether it is Tarun, whether it's Samir, uh, you know, Sumantro, Sumo, Raj Nayak, Rajesh Kamath, you know, these are all, you know, 
absolute fantastic uh, stallions, right? In 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 a context of a of a of a chariot race, like you know, we've uh, there's a movie. Called it's it's the ability for an organization to be able to harness the um uh you know to harness the skills that exist in amongst these people to be able to then you know take it to its extreme now why other organizations have not been able to you know do that i think lies in the initial hiring stage i don't think many of them had hired the right people to begin with you know and we were very fortunate that we took pains over hiring the right people grooming them leaving them alone letting them perform letting them kind of use their own intelligence to really bring about the change that we were looking for and giving them you know a platform to succeed and that's one of the beauties of the company that i used to work for news corp and i think there was you know without doubt uh, i think a unique without kind of, you know, looking over their shoulder every two minutes. So to give them the tools and to allow them to perform. And, um, you know, you know, and one of the things that I, I remember having, having written in the book is that, you know, at, at News Corp and, and also at Star, you know, one didn't get fired for taking a wrong decision. Um, and very often you only got fired if you didn't take a decision. And I think there's a big difference in, the way um, Star at that time used to function to some of the other companies in the organization, in the industry at that, at that particular point in time, um, where, you know, if you took a wrong decision, you were worried because you might lose your job and therefore you were risk averse. Um, whereas in our company and in the company of, you know, the people that I worked with, we all had a, you know, a, a mutual understanding that you did not get fired for taking a wrong decision. So you weren't risk, you know, averse. You would take risks, and if it didn't work, well, that's fine. You know, you try not to make the same mistake a second time, but by and large, you get on with it, you fix it, and you move on. And I think once people get used to that level of freedom um, in their operating style, then they just carry that forward into whichever organization they happen to go to next. And if you look at it. Um, in amongst the list of people that you, you, you mentioned, I think all of them have gone on to perform, you know, brilliantly in, in, you know, the organizations that they're working for now, whether it's Mega Discovery or Tarun at Z5, um, you know, Samir Applause, uh, and so on and so on. And, you know, I think that I think came from the fact that we were very lucky to have them in the first place. Fantastic. Now you also talk about, uh, of course, a lot of times. In the book, there's a mention of the Murdochs. On page 244, you also talk about, I admire James for his clarity of thought and being an intuitively fair person. You know, and then you go on to share some incidents. Uh, so give us a sense of uh, why do you say that? Uh, that's a tough one, Anurag. I think um, you think, you know you caught me on caught caught me off guard there. Uh, but I think the um, you know. What I remember very clearly of James was that he was, he was, um, you know, very young when he arrived at Star. He was also um, very, very charming. He was also, um, you know, a great listener. And one of the things that he had going for him at that particular point in time was that he would listen because he knew that he didn't have that much knowledge about the India marketplace. And but he was, and what he didn't know about the Indian marketplace, he was willing to absorb and listen to other people uh, and their views and then take a calculated uh, decision on whatever it was that happened to be being discussed. Um, and, you know, to give you a specific example would be, would be uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be fair because there were so many of them. And I think I, what I would say is that um, one of the benefits that we had by having James as our leader at that time was the fact that, you know, Rupert was his 
dad is, you know, he could literally pick up the phone and talk to his father about either a particular issue or a set of issues that, you know, needed addressing, which perhaps, uh, you know, a normal senior executive would not be able to do, um, you know, at, at the drop of a hat, whereas James certainly could. Um, and that was a, you know, a, a really unusual benefit that we had, which we were able to kind of, um, you know, utilize to our advantage, which, you know, none of the other organizations had that opportunity. So Sony, for example, did not have that ability to be able to call somebody and say, look, you know, this is what we need to do. They all needed to follow a certain protocol. And one of the things that we did not have in our company at that time was that we did not necessarily need to follow a given protocol in terms of how, you know, how one functions. And I think that made a huge difference. It, it, it kind of, you know, it speeded up and it turbocharged our, our decision making uh, immensely, which, which made a huge difference in terms of speed as well as, uh, you know, benefit derived from it. Fantastic, Peter. I would like to end by asking you uh, two questions. One, uh, as you look ahead in your own personal journey, uh, what is your bucket list? Uh, or you live as every day comes. Uh, and second is when you specifically look at the uh, media businesses in India, what do you think they need to do differently to be able to be relevant profitable and uh, build scale one personal question one professional question oh my goodness all right my bucket list my bucket list would be to um i think to in terms of professional um preference at some level i'd like to work at a uh, or be be working in an environment where i'm working with young people um uh, very young people who have uh, a view to you know the near future uh, and are accustomed to a certain way of thinking, which, um, you know, which I would like to learn from. And um, if there was an opportunity as, you know, in any young, young startup company to be an intern, I would love to do that. That I think for me would be, would be the, you know, a, a, a great opportunity um, rather than running an organization, which is something you asked me earlier. In terms of um, you know media businesses in India, well, look, I think I think they've got a great future. There is whether it's in the area of television, whether it's in um, you know in in even as far as print is concerned. Um, I I think you know broadcast media in India is still a long way from getting saturated, and a long way from um, from seeing a downturn. Um, one of the things that saddens me in the media business in India at the moment is the fact that we have lost sight of delivering quality for the viewer. I think we tend to deliver programming, but fill it to the gunnels with advertising, which is annoying from a viewer point of view. We don't respect the viewer's freedom of choice and you know, there is no sanctity to the amount of minutes per hour of advertising that a broadcast channel or, you know, can carry. And I think if you were to say who was the sponsor of the last India-England cricket match that took place two days ago or three days ago, I think most people would be hard-pressed to say who was the sponsor. Um, of course, it was Paytm. But the point is, very few sponsors are today recognized for the amount of money that they actually spend because there are so many of them and there is no special position given to them. Um, and therefore, I think the more the channels tend to do that simply to kind of recover revenue, I think the more disservice they do to themselves. So I think they're their own worst enemies in some ways. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter, for talking to us as Exchange for Media. Uh, I want to end by asking you, what's your favorite quote these days? What is it that you say to yourself a lot or say to others? Well, I don't have a particular particular quote at this at this point in time in terms of saying this is what I say to you know to either to myself or to or to others. But I do I do like the the quote that 
you read out from, you know, from Elon Musk. And I think that's something that uh, for me has a tremendous amount of resonance uh, even today. And, and, you know, I think we'll continue for the next few years because it, it does say we have to just get on and do it. Um, and, and I'm not going to repeat it because it has profanity in it. But I think, you know, the sense that you get from reading that over and over again, I think is something that, you know, is very, very tangible and very real. And I think that's, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much, Peter. We wish you luck. Wish your book luck. And let me show the book again. It's called Starstruck Confessions of a TV Executive. Uh, and clearly, uh, it's a book worth a read, especially for everyone who's known Peter and who's interacted with uh, him at Star or during his three decade journey, three plus decade journey. So I would recommend that you read it. And uh, I'm sure uh, it'll give you some insights into how Star India was built. And uh, it'll also give you some insights into how to take big bets. So uh, let me again say that's a book worth reading. Uh, get it fast, read it, and uh, share your book reviews. Okay. Thank you, uh, Peter. Thank you once again for talking to us. I'm sure the book will do well. I'm looking forward to your conversation with Raj in the evening. So all the best for that. You and Raj have worked together. So clearly, there are much more anecdotes to talk about. And uh, uh, I really look forward to that. Anurag, thank you very much for having me. As I say, I think that some of the questions that you have posed to me have been, um, you know, have been tough. to support. took me by surprise, one or two of them, um, which is nice. And it's always good from a from a you know a viewer point of view to kind of have those have those questions thrown at somebody who's um, you know not expecting them, but yes, thank you very much. And I'd I'd um, I'd say yes. I think the you know the book is something that um, you know I I feel if people read it, it's generally a fairly easy read. I think most people have said, look, it's very easy to read. I've sat down, I haven't put it down, and I've gone through it in you know in a in a over a weekend. And, and I think that's the way it's been written. It's a very conversational style of, of, uh, of having written it, but I've enjoyed writing it and I hope you enjoy reading it. So thank you for the opportunity, Anurag. Thank you very much. Most welcome. God bless you. Thank you, Peter.